So we're going to be looking, to begin with, at the life of a king, an old king by the name of Jehoshaphat. And he was a good king. He was kind of easily led, I suppose you could say, uh, by wrong people. But, but apart from that, he was a good king. And this is a massive challenge towards the end of his life. Um, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria and they are in Hazon and Tamar, which is En Gedi. And as we've already heard this morning, there's all kinds of things going on in Israel today. But thank the Lord, the, every single Christian has been grafted in. We are part of Abraham's children by faith. And all of us go through times, real times. And this here, what we're looking at here, is an impossible situation in which a good king is completely outnumbered. So the armies are coming against him. There's no possible way Jehoshaphat can win this battle. Uh, battle. There's no way. And it says in verse 3 that Jehoshaphat feared. And how many times do we read in the Bible, do not fear? Do not fear. But we do fear. And it's what we do with fear that counts. Some people, they worry. They worry and worry. And they worry upon worry. And, and upon that worry, they worry more. Now this king knew God. He, he, he knew God. He had a personal relationship with God. Doesn't stop him from fearing. And when we hear bad news and things happen in our lives, it doesn't stop us from fearing. It's what we do with that worry, with that fear. And it says, and Jehoshaphat feared. And then it says, and he set himself to seek the Lord. Now that's somebody that I believe has kind of been through this process before. And we see in his life that he really had. And he knew what to do. And some people know what to do. Some people don't know what to do. You think this morning that everybody knows that when they're in fear, or when they're worrying, when they're in depression, that the right thing to do is seek the Lord. No, people don't know that. The, the vast majority of the world does not know that that's the thing to do. But in Scripture it tells you, when you're frightened, when you're worried, when you're anxious, turn to the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek Him. That means that in a sense you have to put some effort in and seek God out. And that's what we see Jehoshaphat doing. And he set himself to seek the Lord. And at, because he's the king of Israel, he has the, the right to proclaim uh, a fast throughout all of his kingdom, of Judah. And so he proclaims a fast. Now, in Old Testament times, proclaiming a fast simply meant, of course it was a fast, but it means to humble yourself. To humble yourself. That's really what fasting is. It's to humble yourself. To become more dependent upon God. So he was completely outnumbered. And he... Decides that in this situation that he's in, he's going to seek the Lord. And as king, he has the right to, to proclaim that the nation, at this point, humble themselves. And we've looked at this many times before. But that's what happened at Dunkirk, Dunkirk in the Second World War. When the odds were really stacked against this nation. When all of our soldiers could have been wiped out by, by the Nazis. And our king at that time proclaimed a fast, proclaimed uh, a day of prayer. And even at D-Day, by the way, at the other end of the war, 
in America, they proclaimed a, a, a day of prayer that the invasion would go well and that the enemy would be pushed back. So thank God, thank the Lord, there are still one or two leaders out there in the world that have some kind of reverence for God. And so all the cities of Judah, they came, all of them came to seek the Lord. And then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, before the new court. This is the outer court of the temple. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, look, look at his prayer. Are you not God in heaven? Are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand there is not power and might so that no one is able to stand you. Is this not you? And as we grow up at Sunday school, we read about God. We're told about God, that he created everything, that he's all powerful. And Jehoshaphat, as mature as he is as a believer, has to remind himself who God is. Yes. And we have to do that. Yeah. I have to do that. I have to remind myself who God is. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary and in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us and sword and judgment and pestilence or famine, <coughs> we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and will cry out to you in our affliction. In our state, as downcast people, we will cry out to you, O Lord. And you will hear, and you will save. And now here are the people of Ammon and Moab from Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. In other words, Lord, you know we've done nothing to provoke this situation. That's what Jehoshaphat is saying here. You know we've done nothing to provoke this situation, Lord. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given to us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, will not you judge them? And this is the verse. This verse is incredible. This shows you the heart of this king. Imagine having a king like this over this country. Listen to what he says. For we have no power against this multitude that is coming against us. What an acknowledgement. So many people, they, they try and muster something up that's not there. They try and uh, uh, whip up a frenzy or an atmosphere. But here this king, before the people and before God, he says, we have no power. That, we have nothing here, Lord. We have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. And then he goes even further, and I love what he does here. This is the humility of this man. Nor do we know what to do. We've got no power, nor do we know what to do. And I look at, at, the, at where we're at now, at this point in time. Has there ever been so many problems in the world that are coming at once? It's crazy what's going on. It's crazy what's happening how people are being educated. Mandy was telling me she was at a, a school this week and she was something like eight minutes waiting for the children to actually stop so that she, she could start the lesson. They just don't listen anymore. Thank God there are still some godly teachers and head teachers and we have them in this church. But folks, it's going to the wall. 
And we don't have any power. And it says here, number one, we don't have any power. And number two, we don't know what to do. And if we're really honest, we don't know what to do. And when people start the year and they've got this vision chart, For the entire year, for everything that the church is going to do in every month, I'm sorry I don't believe it. Because the just shall live by faith. And you only know what to do when God shows you what to do. And until he shows you what to do, we shouldn't be presumptuous. And so here he says we've got no power, nor do we know what to do. But listen to this, he says, but our eyes are upon you. That's phenomenal. I'm weak, Lord. I've got nothing. I, and I don't know what to do. But my attention's upon you. My eyes are upon you. Now all of Judah, with their little ones, and their wives, and their children, stood before the Lord. Well, surely they, they, they need a strong leader, don't they? At a time like this, when, when the nations are coming against them, You don't want somebody standing at the front and saying, we've got no power and we don't know what to do. (coughs) But let God be God and everybody else a liar. And this is what Jehoshaphat does. God must be God, friends. Quit trying to pretend that we know what to do. We don't. But we, we know that God will show us. And he will show us. He will show us. Straight after this prayer, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon a man called Jehaziel. I'm not going to go through all the names, I'm going to try and keep this simple this morning. But he comes upon this man. Notice, this is a prayer of the penitent. This is a prayer of the humble. Somebody that's acknowledging, I've got no power I don't know what to do, I'm looking, or as a nation, we're looking to you. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit comes upon somebody. That's our God. He's just waiting for us to acknowledge that we don't know what to do. And the Lord will show us what to do. That's our God. And so here... He says, the spirit of the Lord comes upon Jehaziel. And in verse 15 he says, Listen, all you who are of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, because because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but is God's. I can't tell you how many times in my Christian life I have forgotten that simple thing. Can't tell you how many times I have forgotten that simple thing. That the battle that we're in is not our battle. It's the Lord's battle. And I want you to think about that. Once you understand that, everything else begins to make a lot more sense and the peace of God can flow. Why did Jesus come? Why did he come? Why did he come from heaven? Why did he leave heaven and come to this earth? And do what he did? Because the battle belongs to the Lord. It's his battle from start to finish. He came because it's his battle. And he will not leave us because it's his battle. And so very often we go into the flesh, we try and sort things out our own way. And this man that has the Holy Spirit upon him says, Jehoshaphat, this is God's battle. Oh, that the church could allow that to sink in. In these last days that we're living in. That the battle belongs to the Lord. Tomorrow you will go down against them. 
They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. We see this at the Red Sea, don't we? That's what Moses says. We see the same thing with David and Goliath. David says, this is not my battle. I'm not fighting my battle. I'm fighting the Lord's battle. The battle belongs to the Lord, Goliath. That's why I'm going to win you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Christ is with his people. And he promises, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you, no matter what you're going through. And for other people, they might think that what you're going through is very small. But to you it's not small. To you it's a big thing. To you it's a big thing. God knows. And the battle belongs to him. He will fight it for you on your behalf. And Jehoshaphat, look at this here, it's, it's phenomenal. Jehoshaphat bowed his face to the ground and he accepts that this is the answer. So here's a man that comes before the crowds, women and children, older ones, younger ones, and he says to the crowds, we've got no power, we don't know what to do, Lord our eyes are upon you. And the answer comes. And when the answer comes, he bows his face to the ground and he begins to thank God. He's had his answer. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord and worshipping the Lord. Then the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning. And they went into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, This is a man. This is the same man. This is the same man who was battered, who was frightened. He was frightened. Yes, leaders can get very frightened. He was frightened. But he's heard the word of the Lord and he's full of faith. He's full of faith. He's full of belief. And he says to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. And whatever it is in your life, friends, whatever you're going through, it's the same thing. Turn to Jesus and believe in him. Put your faith in him, and you shall be established. God will make a way where there may be no way. And he says, believe in his prophets. Now these are good prophets he's talking about here, not crazies. These are not crazy people. These are good prophets. He says, believe in his prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. So this is his battle plan. This is Jehoshaphat's battle plan. And you look at the, the armoury at the moment that we see around the world, all this technical armoury, which is outstandingly expensive, by the way. These, miss, these missiles cost millions that we let off and we see go boom. They cost millions. And there's so much technical drones now that can go underneath, nuclear drones that go underneath the water like a, a, a submarine and tactical nukes and so many things that we have today. And we, we, we get ourselves into a thing where we must meet them the same way that they meet us. Same thing happens in a church. They've hurt me, I've got to hurt them. Families hurt me, I've got to hurt them. And hurting people go around hurting people. Yes. That's what happens. But look at what he faces this with. He faces up to this insurmountable problem we're singing to the Lord. That makes no sense. And this is what it says. 
And it just got me this did this week. This is what it says. And he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness. So this isn't just him saying like, right guys, we're going to come. We're going we're gonna to bring the loudest instruments that we've got. We're going to get the biggest drums and the biggest cymbals and we're going we're to crash them through the cities, proclaiming. It actually talks about something that is so utterly intimate. Something that's within, 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 that within the shadow of the Almighty, hidden away in the secret place. He's going to come at the enemy, praising them, praising the Lord in the beauty of holiness. What on earth is that? What on earth is that? And so they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. What is the beauty of holiness? Well, I suggest to you that the beauty of holiness begins with this. You must come to God on his terms. That's the beginning of even understanding the beauty of holiness. You must come to God on his terms. The word holy means to be set apart. He is God, is set apart from us. He's totally different to us. The way that we think is not the way that he thinks. Our plans are not his plans. And so if we're going to worship him in the correct way, in the beauty of holiness, we must come to God, not on our terms, but on his terms. Does everybody understand that? And when we come into church in the morning, and thank God, as a church, we get on with one another. Some of us have known one another a long, long time. And uh, we've been through things together. And it's good to greet one another and it's good to shake hands. It's good to do all those things. And we, sh we should never not do those things. But there's another reason why we come together, friends. We come together to meet with the living God. And if, we, if we're coming together to meet with the living God and to worship him in the beauty of holiness, we must come on his terms. We can come on our terms. He won't interfere. But we will not get the same blessing and sense of the presence of God as if we come on his terms. Now let me run through what I mean by that this morning quickly before we go on. First and foremost, his terms are to lead you into the Holy of Holies. And there's a way into the Holy of Holies prescribed by God himself, of which he said to Moses, make sure that you make the tabernacle exactly as I say. There's one way in, and you go from the outer court to the holy place, finally into the Holy of Holies. God's terms are always to lead you into the Holy of Holies. Some of us don't even know what the Holy of Holies is this morning. It's okay. We'll get there at the end. I'm not going to be able to explain the Holy of Holies in a million lifetimes. But that's his desire for you. And that's his desire for me. I know it is. So why do we take it to be such a light thing? Church, when we come together, it's good to hug one another and bless one another, but remember why we're coming together. To worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now, I want to show you th this morning what this looks like in heaven. And according to Jesus, we're to pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it 
as it is in heaven. We should be worshipping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And as you'll see this morning, in heaven, the word holy is used a lot in worship. Have you never? The word holy is used a lot. Now, I'm going to sing, not because I can sing, I can't sing. But I want to, Mandy's going to come, come on Mandy. I want you to, you, you probably won't even know this song, it doesn't matter. But I want you to sing the chorus. You'll get the chorus. Because friends, there's, there's, there's something about coming to God His way. And not our way. A prescribed way. And when we get where we should be, it's a holy place. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Lifting holy hands in worship. We will not bow down to the gods of men. The God of Israel, you are. because these are God's terms. If we ever want to move on, friends, if we ever want to see the hand of the Lord move in our times, we have to be like Jehoshaphat and say, Lord, we haven't got the power. We don't even know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And he came and he says, we're going to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. What does that mean? It means we must come to God on his terms. And there's a way. First of all, his terms are to lead us into the Holy of Holies. It's always the same. And I don't think we always get there. And I think as a church um, in, in, in Bo Green loves to worship God. They love to worship God, but I don't think we always get there. And, and it's, it's the same with many, many churches. I think sometimes we fall short. And Jesus wants us in the Holy of Holies. Secondly, the Holy of Holies reveals something. We don't just go in the Holy of Holies for a nice feeling. The Holy of Holies reveal, reveal the risen Christ and the finished work of the cross. That's what the Holy of Holies reveal. The risen Christ and the absolute finished work of the cross. When you go into the Holy of Holies, you realise this one thing. The battle has always belonged to the Lord. Yeah. 
And the one thing that, you will see, that, that, that you'll see is that what is decentralised in church today is absolutely central in heaven. What is decentralised in church today, and people are, e are even ashamed of it, is absolutely central to heaven. And we're supposed to be replicating what's in heaven. And we'll look at that at the end. Have a look at Psalm 100 this morning. Psalm 100 verse 1. Make a joyful shout to the Lord. All you lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us. He's made us. We have not made ourselves. He has made us. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise and be thankful to him and bless his name. There is a prescribed way to come in and know the beauty of holiness and it's through the outer court first. It's bit by bit and in the outer court we're to come and thank him. We're to come in with a thankful heart. No matter, no matter, this is the difference between a Christian and somebody that doesn't know the Lord. We worship the Lord no matter how we feel. We thank the Lord no matter how we feel. So we enter in with thanksgiving in our heart. We celebrate our covenant relationship with God. Do you know that? We're coming to celebrate our covenant relationship with God. That we belong to him. And he is committed to us. We belong to him and he is committed to us. Whatever affects us, affects him. If you don't believe that, go and look at the Garden of Eden. Why do you think he came? Why do you think Jesus came? Because whatever affects us, affects him. He is utterly faithful. He is omnipresent, that means all powerful, all, 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 all present. He is omniscient, that means he knows everything. And he is omnipotent, that means he's all powerful. Nothing can add or subtract to God. God is, he is who he is. He is, I am that I am. He rules over all the nations and he decides their destinies. And the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Psalm 84, verse 1. How lovely, how lovely, there's a good old northern word, how lovely, how lovely is your tabernacle. It's lovely, I tell you it was lovely. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for even the courts of the Lord. Even the outer courts, my soul longs and faints for the courts of the Lord <coughs> and for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where, where she may lay her young even on your altars, O Lord. The psalmist is saying here, even the sparrow has a house, the birds have a house. The psalmist is saying, my house is where you live. That's my house. My house is where you live. And if I'm where you are, I'm a happy man. Oh, Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. And this is the house. I don't mean this physical building, you understand. When the people of God come together, we become a house. For in, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. I spent my life, 20, first 24 years of my life outside of church, trying to do it my way. What a fine mess I got myself into. 
trying to do it my way. No, friends, when you come into the courts of the Lord, when you come into his house, things are so completely different. Psalm 65 verse 4. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. It's a bit like, how did the animals come to, to Noah? How did they come to Noah? But they did. They came to Noah. Two by two. You know, they came to Noah. And it says, blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. You see, when God saves you, it's, it's, a, it's a work on two parts. It's God reaching out to you. And he reaches out to you. But you have to accept that and reach out and grab his hand and say, I'm willing to come with you, Lord. I'm willing to come with you. And he says, blessed is the man who you choose and cause to approach you that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. You see, friends, church, if, if we are going to experience the beauty of God's holiness, we have to come on his terms. Does everybody understand that? We must come on his terms. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. The sacrifice of praise to God. That, that it, it, sometimes it's a sacrifice, is it not? When you're not feeling good or you're not feeling well, I felt as rough as a dog last week, I've got to be honest with you. I stood here thinking, I don't quite know how I'm getting through this, Lord, but I am. But you bring a sacrifice of praise to God. That's the way for the Christian. It's a sacrifice. But we come and we praise him no matter what. We lift our voices no matter what. We must come to God his way, not our way. Acts chapter 16, verse 25, talking about a sacrifice of praise. <coughs> but at midnight, <coughs> Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. They'd just been beaten black and blue for sharing the gospel. They'd been whipped. Their, backs had been, their garments had been stripped off and they'd been whipped. And at midnight... They choose to pray and sing praises to God. Folks, that is not normal. It's easy for me to stand here and say that and you all go, yeah, that's right, we've read it a million times. We know what Paul and Silas did. But that's not normal to do that when you've been beaten black and blue. That is completely abnormal. But look what happens. There's an earthquake, the foundations shake and the prisoners are set free. Because people are listening in. The prisoners are listening in. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so it's so important. It's so many of us in this last year or two have been waiting for results. We just had some more come through this morning. Very difficult time when you're waiting for results. You know, your mind's going all over the place. But you bring a sacrifice of praise. No matter what. We must come to God on his terms. And we're not, many of us here now, we're not babies anymore. We've been around long enough to know we have to be adult. We've got to be mature and bring a sacrifice of praise. Matthew chapter 26 is one scripture that doesn't really get much airtime. But when you think about it, it's outstanding. Jesus had just shared his last Passover with the disciples. He told the disciples he was going to be betrayed and he knew what was coming to him within hours. The torture, the beatings, the crucifixion, the scourging of the whip where even his internal organs would be laid bare. He wouldn't even be able to carry his own cross because of his loss of blood. But well, here he is, he's broken bread with the disciples, he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. 
And in verse 30 it says, And when they had sung a hymn, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Why? Why did Jesus sing a hymn? Why did he sing a hymn? Because even Christ himself brought a sacrifice of praise to his Father, knowing that this was the right thing. This was the right thing. And he sang. He sang. Imagine singing when you know what's coming. But he sang. And we know what he sang. But listen, friends, whatever affects us, affects him. We're in a covenant relationship with God. That's why he came. That's why he came. Because whatever affects us, affects him. And he came. He's telling the disciples not to worry. In my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'd go away to prepare a place for you. Whatever affects us affects him. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. But on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus and the disciples sang. That's a sacrifice of praise, is it not? We know what he sang. We know he sang Psalm 118. They're called the Psalms of Ascent. The Psalms of Ascent. And right at the end of the Passover, they would have sang this psalm. I don't want you to think about this because this is just incredible. I told you last week, I'd already planned to do something on worship. But last week, as, they, as this Jamaican lady is wheeling me out of the inspection room in hospital... She's saying to me, we've got to bring a sacrifice of praise to God. We've got to come in the right way. We've got to approach him in the right way. This Jamaican lady is saying to me, we've got to come to God the right way. I'm thinking, how does she know? How does she know? She can't know. It was like the Holy Spirit. It really was like the Holy Spirit saying, I want you to bring this. I want you to bring this. Not just for you, for me. To bring a sacrifice of praise to the Lord. Now listen, Jehoshaphat was feared. The Lord knows what we're like. He knows what I'm like. Goodness me. He knows what you're like. He knows we suffer, but sometimes suffer with depression. He knows. Whatever affects you affects him. We're in a covenant relationship with God. He loves us. It's not said enough. He loves us. In Psalm 118, Jesus was singing this psalm as he, with, the, with the disciples as he went to Gethsemane when he prayed. And this is what the psalm says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercies endure forever. What was the hymn? What was the song that Jehoshaphat and the musicians faced off the enemy with. This exact thing. This exact thing. They faced off the enemy and they sang this. Exactly this. And they sang it in the beauty of holiness. They sang it in the beauty of holiness. As the armies are ready to wet their swords in, in Israeli blood. They began to sing, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endure forever. That's what they sang. And that's what Jesus sang on his way to Gethsemane. And in some uh, translations, it's translated, For his love endures forever. Let Israel now say, his mercies endure forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, His mercies endure forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, His mercies endure forever. And they sang this psalm of God's mercies to Gethsemane. And Jesus gets down on his face in Gethsemane and says, Thy will be done. Thy will be done. And in order for his mercies to endure forever, his only son 
would have to be beaten black and blue, whipped and scourged upon the cross. He would have to hang upon that cross and take the punishment of all of our sin, even the smallest sins, even the simplest lie, even the smallest thing that we've stolen. Christ had to hang upon that cross and bear out the penalty of our sin in order for this psalm to make any kind of sense. His mercies endure forever. And we know what happens at the end. He cries out, of course, it is finished. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn. Jesus lifted up his voice and yielded up his spirit. This is when Jesus died. The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom and the earth quaked. Why? Because God is committed to us. He's committed to his people. We've been made in in his image. All of us have fallen. We've all inherited sin. Every one of us. And we have all sinned in some way. Small or great. But he's committed to saving you. Jesus wants you to be saved. He wants you in heaven with him in his house. He is committed to keeping his covenant with Abraham. And that covenant with Abraham is, I will will bless you, Abraham, but I'll also bless your descendants and even the other nations through you. He is utterly faithful, friends. He is utterly faithful. And not even death can defeat him. Not even death can defeat him. Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 2 talks about the holy place, for a tabernacle was prepared. The first part in which was the lampstand and the table and the showbread, which is the sanctuary. Listen, friends, to what I'm saying. We have to come to God on his terms. First we come into the outer court and we praise him. We thank him for what he's done. But then we come to the holy place and we break bread together. We break bread in the holy place. And in the holy place, you have the lampstand, you have the table of showbread, and you have the altar of incense. It's a very holy place. And that's why the scriptures warn us about the way that we take the bread and the wine. Because it's a holy place. But he doesn't even want us to stop there. He wants us to push through into the holy of holies. And that place is available for every born-again Christian. Every Christian. It's available for them. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. Hebrews 10, verse 20. Verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us. He consecrated for us. We are to worship him in the beauty of holiness. And he, not us, Not us. He has consecrated this way. (coughs) Through the veil, that is his flesh. And the book of Hebrews makes it very clear that as we go through the veil, it's not taken away, but it's torn from top to bottom. We have to push through the veil, which represents his torn body. His torn body. So there's no other way into heaven. I hope you can get this this morning. There's no other way into heaven. You'll never be good enough. Nobody is. And nobody ever will be. The only way into heaven is through what Jesus went through upon the cross. Through his shedding of the blood. There's no other way. And so we either come into heaven through what Jesus accomplished at the cross or we don't come into heaven. It's one or the other. And you're here this morning because God loves you. And whatever you're going through, the Holy Spirit has come and he will show you the way to heaven. He'll show you your sin, he does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He'll show you your sin, but he'll also show you the way and he will point you to Jesus. In Leviticus chapter 16, it tells you not to be very, very careful how you approach God. 
Leviticus 16 says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in a cloud and be merciful. No, you can't come any old how. If you want to know this this place that many Christians have been to and it's changed their life forever, there's a prescribed way and we must worship God in the beauty of... It's his holiness. He's consecrated the way. He's sprinkled us in his own blood. He's made us righteous. There's a way. There's a way. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, we see how important it is that we declare who and what God is. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees heaven and he sees these awesome creatures that God has made, seraphim. And these seraphim are around the throne and these seraphim are saying, holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, there is no one like you, Lord. You are holy, holy, there is no one like you, Lord. There's a place, there's a secret place. There's a place where there's a still small voice. And the Lord wants to minister to us. And he wants us to minister to him. And to serve him. It's the holy of holies. Have a look at Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation 4 we see heaven. And in heaven there's a throne. People think when they get to heaven they're going to see these little cute cherubim. Playing harps on cotton wool clouds. But that's not what heaven's like. Heaven is an awesome place. And it's awesome because God is everywhere. And he sits upon this throne. And the angels and the archangels and the seraphim, they worship him. Hundreds upon thousands upon thousands worship him. And they cast their crowns before him. And they tell him night and day, You are holy, holy, wave after wave of adoration to God in heaven. And here we see in Revelation chapter 4, we see the elders and we see these living creatures and they're saying the same thing. Holy, 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 Lord God almighty, you are the El Shaddai, the almighty one. Jehoshaphat says... We've got no power, but we look to you. Our eyes look to you. Who is he? He's the Almighty. He's got everything, friends. It's, as Corrie Ten Boom says, we must come to God's storehouse. He has everything we need for every situation. And they come, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then we get to Revelation chapter 5. You see, this is God's terms. This this isn't the way that we do it. Depending on what kind of music you're into, you might be into a bit of the old rhythm and blues, or you might be into this thing or that thing, and we all have different ways of coming in church. But God has one way. We come through the court. We come into the holy place, and we get ourselves ready to experience and worship Him. Him, who lives forever and ever, who knows us by name, who's written our names in the palm of his hands where the nail prints are. They're there. And this is what it says. In heaven, there's this moment where they ask a simple question. Is there anybody on this earth that has ever lived that is worthy to take the title deeds of eternity and be entrusted with them. Who can be entrusted with eternity? Is there anybody? 
And John weeps because there's nobody that has ever lived that can be entrusted or be found worthy or weighed against the glory of God. No one. There's nobody apart from one. And he left heaven because what affects us affects him. He left heaven because of us. Because of us to save us. And he came to this earth and he was tempted in every way that you and I are. In every sin that we've been tempted in, he was tempted in and he never sinned, not once. And he died at the end of his life as innocent as the day he was born. And the question is, who is worthy? And the answer goes out, there is one. And this is what it says. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders. Do you understand what this is saying? Many Christians don't. It's saying that what we're looking at here is the middle of the middle of the middle. If you want to know what is absolutely central, and we sang it this morning just before we broke bread, what is absolutely central to heaven is Jesus. But not only Jesus, the finished work of the cross. That's what this is saying. I looked and I saw one who had been slain standing. Prevailing. Standing. He was dead but he's alive. He's fully alive. He's very alive. He's standing. But he was slain. But he's standing. And at the very centre of the centre of the centre of heaven, there is one that died in your place. And died in my place. <clears throat> I want you to think about that. We've gone through a lovely time where we've been allowed decentralized banking for a time with things like Bitcoin. People have invested in Bitcoin and things like that. We've lived in a time where we have a decentralized internet where for a time you could say whatever you want. You can join whatever group you want and, and, and be whatever you want on the internet. And it's all decentralized. Anybody can say anything. You've got Satanists popping up left, right and centre. Anything goes. We're living in a time where the nations are decentralised, religions are decentralised. But the Bible tells me that these things will come to an end. The internet, which is now decentralised and you can look at whatever you want, you're free to, will be centralised. And you will only be able to take in what they tell you is right. The banking system, which is decentralised right now, they are already preparing for a one world banking system. Now, a digitalised banking system. The banking system will be centralised. They're looking for the world governments to come together instead of this kind of politics or that kind of politics, democracy. Or It's going to come together and there's going to be a completely centralised government. And what's coming in the future, the Bible says, is a horrible centralised religion. Now, I, this is the point. This is the point. Listen so carefully, because this is so simple you'll miss it. In heaven, right now, in heaven, there is one who is at the centre of the centre of the centre of heaven. Jesus. And his gospel is our only hope. There is no other hope outside of the gospel. You ain't going to make the rapture without the gospel. First and foremost, the hope of hope of hopes is the gospel. And in heaven, forever, it's been the centre of everything. And in the days that we live in, it's been decentralised. Churches have decentralised the gospel. They've pushed the gospel to be a side issue, a sideshow. 
And the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. There's no other way of being saved apart from through the gospel. But today in churches, the gospel is like a bolt on. It's this thing or that thing. What we're about is this. But the bride of Christ in the last days will re-centralize the key message. And the key message is this. Christ died for us. Christ died for sinners. He died and he rose again on the third day and he ascended to heaven and he's with the Father at his right hand. That is the central message of Christianity. That's what Jehoshaphat proclaimed when he proclaimed, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for his mercies endure forever. How can those mercies endure apart from through the cross? When Jesus sang Psalm 118, going down to the Garden of Gethsemane, oh, give thanks to the Lord for his mercies endure forever. How can his mercies endure for you and me if he didn't go to the cross? The central, central, central message of Christianity is that Christ died for sinners. And it's the only place you'll ever arrive to. There is no greater truth. There is no higher truth. There is no deeper truth. There's nowhere to go from there. When you've got there, you've arrived. It might take you a million, billion lifetimes to fully comprehend how much God loves you. But there's no greater truth than that. Christ died for sinners. He came on our behalf to die in our place. That is the message, friends. That is the message. And Jehoshaphat knew, if I'm going to face the enemy, I've got to come God's way. Because if I come God's way, then the battle belongs to the Lord.